Hello, I'm Mia Windsor, and this is my presentation on using raw audio neural network systems to define musical creativity. The case studies I'll be referring to are data bots who use a modified sample RNN architecture to generate audio in distinct subgenres, and OpenAI Jukebox who generate songs using a hierarchical VQVAE transformer raw audio neural network to produce songs from a variety of genres. So um, I'll start by talking about existing definitions of creativity. I'll then talk a little bit about combinatorial creativity as defined by Bowden, then transformational creativity, where I'll also review some of the tracks and albums made by the case studies. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about how raw audio neural networks are useful for us as humans. Thinking about existing definitions of creativity, the broad consensus is that creativity is the capacity to produce things that are original and valuable. Bowden goes a step further and separates creativity into three distinct categories. Combinatorial, when novelty arises out of unfamiliar combinations of existing ideas. Exploratory, uh, so creating ideas through already existing conventions. And transformational or radical, so altering the conceptual space itself such that new ideas uh, are generated that do not fit into previous style or convention. Bowden also argues that the artist must have fully explored the conceptual space in question in order for transformation to occur. I'm using this framework in this presentation and paper just because it's quite useful for categorization and um, I will be building on it throughout as well. David Cope's definition of musical creativity was the only definition I could find on musical creativity specifically that was, non that was also non-human centric. Uh, Cope's definition is uh, very much process-based. He defines creativity as the initialization of connections between two or more multi multifaceted things, ideas, or phenomena hitherto not otherwise considered actively connected. So, focusing first on combinatorial creativity, Cope states that the secret of successful creativity lies not in the invention of new alphabet letters or musical pictures, but in the elegance of the combination and recombination of the existing letters and pictures. Linked to this is Mercer's notion that music is a Humboldt system. Um, a Humboldt system is a system that can generate infinite diversity by finite means, where the phenomena do not blend their properties. The first thing that was obvious to me about these two statements is that rural audio neural networks are working with a much more varied sound palette than just a ma matter of pictures. Focusing a little more on Merkur's argument, um, it's certainly convincing in that with the situation of raw audio neural nets, there's still a finite number of samples from the training data which are combined together to create infinite possibility, which thus suggests a Humboldt system, and the samples technically do not blend by averaging their properties. What I think is less convincing is that in my perception, because of how tiny all the samples are, um, they do appear to blend. Um, this will be discussed later in the transformational creativity section. Um, I think it's also important to note that uh, there are methods now for technically blending sound, such as convolution. So convolution is where frequency spectra of two audio sources are multiplied, resulting in the frequencies that are shared between the two sources being accentuated and the frequencies that are not shared being attenuated, thus literally blending the audio sources together, which thus proves Merkur's argument to be somewhat redundant. Merkur also disregards Hanslick and Varese's definitions of music because they do not distinguish music from speech, though Hanslick and Varese's definitions could be regarded as possibly too on the extreme of noise or whatever. Um, it is still really important to note that timbre and production, and thus more noisy and complicated timbres, are often paramount in popular music and a lot of contemporary music, and are also often too complicated to be worth representing in symbolic form. This therefore suggests that Cope and Merkur's arguments are outdated because they're mostly applicable to music that can be only represented symbolically, such as classical music, for example. So in this section, I'll be discussing transformational creativity as defined by Bowden. Cope states that in order for computer programs to create, they must themselves develop and extend rules and not simply follow instructions provided by the programs. Raw audio neural networks, I'd say, are arguably capable of transforming the composition and production of their input material. 
An interesting quotation from Databox's 2017 paper says that solo vocalists become a lush choir of ghostly voices, rock bands become crunchy cubist jazz, and crossbreeds of multiple recordings become a surrealist chimera of sound. This implies a very, very specific, visible, and clearly interesting and inhuman aesthetic. In this section, we'll be having a listen to some of the outputs from these neural network systems. Um, because, of course, everyone experiences music differently, um, I've avoided quantifying anything in this, in this discussion. Um, so I'd advise um, taking a listen to uh, this music yourselves and seeing what you make of it. But um, it seems quite transformational to me, at least. Focusing first on some of the content that I, from the jukebox samples that I found quite interesting. Um, I'm going to play the start of classic pop in the style of Frank Sinatra, which is quite a hilarious song, and I would recommend listening to. It's Chris. Um, I just found those string stabs quite interesting because it's almost like it sounds almost like. Um, the harmony is a little bit garbled and from a distance, so you can't actually tell what the chords are. And I just found that to be quite an interesting listening experience. I really, really liked the end of um, jazz in the style of Ella Fitzgerald, which I'll play now and then talk about. I like that bit because you kind of still have the sound of the original double bass from the track, so you still have that contextual congruity, yet um, there's some interesting almost FM-like percussion sounds and weird sort of um, weird sort of steam sounds coming from the track. Um, and I don't know, I found that to be quite interesting and fun, and I genuinely consider sampling, so I'd argue that to be transformational. Moving on to the Databots album, um, so they generated an album based on um, the album Mirrored by Battles, um, the math rock band. Um, so I'll play a bit of the original and then a bit of the Databots version. <laughs> I like how crazy the rhythmic effects have kind of gone on that and sort of how timbrely intricate it is. Um, I'd, I'd go as far to say with that one and also some of the other albums that it almost sounds like the sounds have kind of blended together because they are so tiny and intricate that you can't sort of perceive what has been pieced. And yeah, I, I really like that one in particular. Um, so this one I found particularly interesting um, because it there's some weird sort of vocal styles that aren't present present in the original album and also there's this weird sort of like buzzing sound that sort of comes in and keeps trying to sort of take over the track which I sound, found particularly unnerving which wasn't really an original effect the effect in the original album so this is um trained on the album nothing by the metal band Meshuga um, and I'll play a little bit of it So, uh, reflecting on that listening experience, um, I would argue that through its imperfections, these raw audio neural nets have actually been able to go beyond their training material to create something that appears to be genuinely transformational. Unlike Bowdoin's requirements for transformational creativity, these transformations occur through errors rather than fully exploring some kind of conceptual space. In fact, both David Novitz and Holly Herndon have suggested that close acquaintance with conceptual spaces can actually inhibit 
creativity, which uh, disproves that suggestion by Bowdoin. Many examples of musical creativity in the age of technology have actually come through humans recognising their creative potential in the sound of something going wrong or unexpected and exploiting this. Some examples of this include Grandmaster Flash's discovery of scratching, so using records as sources for percussive expressive sounds, or the exploitation of the Roland TB303 in the acid house genre. Um, which was originally uh, designed to simulate bass guitars um, and then people discovered that you could make quite fun squelching sounds out of it. Um, so I think the most important uh, and most relevant example to this is actually the idea of glitch music, so exploiting software not working in a way that is expected in, in a way that is expected, that produces a sound that's so inhuman that it sounds very distinct to the human listener, and then it, organizing this into sound collages or whatever. Um, Oval is quite a good example of an artist who does this, and aesthetically, um, a lot of glitch albums do have a similar resemblance to these raw audio, um, to this raw audio that's been generated by these systems. I think it's also important to discuss other methods for transformational creativity by machines here. Um, so Sangler discusses in his paper on glitch um, that genetic mutation could also be considered to be a glitch. Um, this led me to start thinking about genetic algorithms in relation to uh, diversifying the outputs of machine systems. So um, genetic algorithms, though they're unable to learn, they can develop beyond a source material and the listener's expectations by breeding and mutating musical ideas over multiple generations. Then entities that are so entities that are selected to cross over or breed are determined by a fitness function that can be based on rules, randomness, or even human input. Um, genetic algorithms may be useful for transforming music beyond its source material, especially in systems that use MIDI and symbolic models, uh, where there's less complexity and therefore less potential for glitches to occur naturally. Um, David Cope's Emily Howell program is also worth mentioning. So uh, Emily Howell is a system that can recognize anal analogous material and feeds itself through recursion. Um, it could also make analogies to works that are not in the primary database for the purpose of illusion or providing more general context. Um, I'd say Emily Howell is definitely worth mentioning, but again, it's another one of those situations where it's useful, but possibly quite limited in what it's applicable to. So in this case, it's mostly only applicable to classical music that can be re represented in MIDI or symbolic form. So it's super important to talk about why these systems are actually useful. Um, so databots um, are very, very vocal in the fact that they believe that their sample RNN can be exploited by pioneering artists. They did a collaboration with the UK beatboxer Reaps one, where he did a duet with his AI self, which I thought was really, really fun and engaging to listen to. Um, databots also did a collaboration with the music theory YouTuber Adam Neely, um, where they basically generated an infinite bass solo based on Neely's playing. Uh, what I think was really significant about this is the fact that Neely actually encouraged viewers to sample sections from what the sample RNN had generated to create their own tracks. Um, this is really significant because it shows that the use of raw audio neural networks can be an effective creative tool for human composition. Um, more generally, it seems that combinatorial and transformational creativity in machines may help us to develop our own other artists and even other machines material in ways we cannot predict due to our preconceived expectations or other machines limitations, which, as you can imagine, could be a really, really creative um, method for um, helping to compose music. To conclude, I have argued that raw audio neural networks are capable of combinatorial creativity. I have argued that traditional assumptions regarding musical creativity are revolved too strongly around symbolic representations of composing. I have suggested that raw audio neural networks are capable of transformational creativity through subtle glitches and imperfections, which also therefore implies that, the con that conceptual spaces do not have to be fully explored for transformation to occur. And I've also suggested some alternative methods for transformation creativity in machines and evidenced how transformational possibilities can be useful for human musicians or diversifying the outputs of other machines.
thank you very much for listening to my presentation. <laughs>